all this is dr mobeen sayed from drbeen.com welcome to one more show so with us we have our own dr mark levet he is i think you know him very well so first of all let's introduce him and let's invite him and then i'll uh, introduce him as well so welcome dr levet great to be with you again thank you so i am very quickly going to introduce the hospital where you work so dr levet is in children's national hospital washington dc here is the dr levet's bio as well so he is the colorectal and pelvic reconstructive surgeon and he has joined children's national hospital community to lead a new highly specialized colorectal surgery program this program will be the first in the mid atlantic region to fully integrate surgery urology gynecology and gastroenterology into one cohesive program for children dr levet check this out dr levet is an internationally recognized expert in the surgical care and treatment of pediatric colorectal disorders he has performed over 10000 surgeries to address a wide spectrum of problems involving the colon and rectum more than any other full time practicing pediatric surgeon in the world so with this i'm i'm going to welcome dr levet once more mm -hmm. so once more welcome thank you for being here it is an honor to actually have the world's top surgeon with us tell us a little bit about your day to day activities and then we'll start our topic that sounds very good i wish my mom had heard you uh, introduce me um my day to day activities is taking care of children um with colorectal problems um surprisingly many people don't even know you can have a colorectal problem but um babies are born without an anal opening for example that needs surgery babies are born with something called hirschsprung's disease where the colon doesn't work properly and there are many patients with severe constipation that sometimes needs a surgeon and there are patients that have fecal incontinence and soiling related to for example their spina bifida So there's lots of work to be done. I operate 3 full days a week and I see patients the other days um in a clinic um and uh try to take care of as many patients as we possibly can uh to solve their colorectal uh concerns. Got it. Thank you very much. And Kelly says that I'm sure Dr. Levitt's mom is proud of him and I think I am sure of that as well. So with this uh, ready to start our topic Yes, let's do that. So, um last session, this is a two-parter and this is the part 2. We went through the management of patients with fecal incontinence and constipation, focusing mainly on the medical treatment, the medication, and sometimes the enemas that are required to make these patients clean and in normal underwear. I'm very passionate about achieving that for patients and ideally that is accomplished at the age of potty training when all other kids are getting out of diapers and getting into normal underwear and some kids for the reasons that I explained are unable to do that anatomy wise because of some colon or rectal problem or the nerve control of continence is affected by a problem with the spine or the colon moves too slowly leading to severe constipation we talked about the medical treatment and then i'm sure some might say why do you have a surgeon talking about this topic well the reason why you have a surgeon is because there are there is a role for surgery and what i want to handle in the next segment are what are the surgical options to help patients with fecal incontinence and constipation and that's what this session is all about got it all right well i have a whole collection of these kinds of books as you can imagine when people get by me gifts this is what i typically get and amazingly people don't recognize that this physiologic process of eliminating stool is not something that can be taken for granted there are patients out there with 
anatomic reasons that does not allow them to stool normally. And we have solutions for these patients, and that's the good news. Challenge is to find these patients, to have these patients come to us or any center that focuses on such problems and get their problems solved. But I will tell you, with the advent of the internet and family groups, there is a much more activity. These patients are not hiding in the shadows as they were at the beginning of my career. Now they are finding us. They're able to do an internet search. They're able to find a center near them that solves the problem of fecal incontinence. So let's take a typical case. Um, the next slide uh, shows um, a, for a typical 10-year-old child who has constipation. Likely they have had constipation their whole life. Usually once they started on solid food, they have been on many different laxative regimens, none have worked, and they have severe symptoms. They have cramping. They may even have soiling of the underwear. All of this related to constipation. And this is a common story. Mm -hmm. You can have patients in a pediatrician's office with constipation, and amazingly, it is 10% of all pediatric visits relates to constipation. And for patients that come to the emergency room with abdominal pain, it is the number one cause of abdominal pain, not appendicitis, but constipation That pay, for patients that uh, end up in an emergency room. So I have a question here. So I remember in my younger time, if sometimes I would have constipation or abdominal pain, instead of uh, our parents, instead of saying, all right, let's go to a doctor if needed, they would usually ask me that you're going to the restroom, habits are not correct, or you do not drink enough water. Uh, is it possible that sometimes when we are doing this to the children at home, that might aggravate their situation and the earlier contact with the doctor is better? I do not know what is correct. Well, so that is a question. I mean, I can tell you constipation is incredibly common. Um, so we're really only talking about the outliers, the patients that, first of all, many are self-medicated. The parents know to give a little bit more hydration, change the diet a little bit. That's not the group of patients we're talking about. We're not even talking about the group of patients that go to their pediatrician and their pediatrician can fix them very quickly. We're talking about the outliers. We're talking about the patients that have such severe symptoms Many medical reg regimens have been attempted, many different types of laxatives. The pediatrician has been involved. Maybe even a pediatric gastroenterologist has been involved, and they continue to have these symptoms. That's when you need a surgeon. And this session is about the surgeon's role in those patients. And that's why on this slide, there's a picture of a spectrum from the most benign to the most complicated. Um, and we're talking about those in the far right, the red, the red zone of constipation, so to speak. Got it. Thank you. All right. So how do we define when medical, when maximal medical therapy has failed? Every different laxative regimen has been tried and the patients still have trouble. Well, patients such as those who have failure to thrive, they are not growing. Their constipation is so bad that they are impacted and they won't eat. Laxatives are tried, but they cause intolerable symptoms. Laxatives simply don't work. They don't empty the colon successfully. The patients, despite medical treatment, continue to have soiling, accidents, continue to have pain. Those that have even participated in what we would call a bowel management week, a bowel management program, what I described in the first session, are not better, even though they've had aggressive therapy. And then patients who have had flushes of the colon, people know what enemas are, but there are ways to give enemas through the colon from the top down, which I'm going to go into in a minute, those are not working. Well, wow, that's a really severe case. For those patients, the surgeon might need to get involved. 
So our first step in this um, process of figuring out how to help this patient is to do what's called a contrast enema. This is a x-ray which lights up the colon and I think everyone can see that the colon at the bottom is quite enormous and distended and with stool. You can see the black patchy areas are stool content within the colon. This is a very problematic, very enlarged colon from chronic constipation. We look at the width, how wide is the colon. We look at whether it's redundancy, whether it looks like a loop-de-loop -loop, uh, roller coaster. This one does a little bit. It actually curves down and then back up um, as you trace it to the north. If you go up, up, up with your pointer, keep going, keep going, keep going, up, 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 and then it comes back down, straight down, straight down, and now, and then it goes back up again, off to the left. Yes, yeah, so that so is- So I have a question. Is this just the empty spaces because of the, the loop here, or these are the fecal material as well? Yeah, that's fecal material. The loop is off to the side, if you can see right there. That's right. the loop. It goes right. up and then goes back. It goes down and then back up. And of course, we always have to be suspicious of Hirschsprung's disease, but Hirschsprung's disease in these cases have has been ruled out. And to learn more about Hirschsprung disease, I would refer to you to the other session we did on that very topic. So these patients do not have Hirschsprung's disease. They just have, well, it's not just, but they have constipation, but so severe that no medications are working and they continue to have terrible symptoms related to the constipation. Got it. And for the viewers, after this talk is over, I will link the Hirschsprung disease discussion that we did to this talk. Plus, I would link the previous talk that we did for the constipation and fecal incontinence. And do we have a special reward for all of the participants that saw all of the colorectal sessions? I think we should have one reward. <laughs> so uh, maybe we should do a test for all of these quest, uh, lectures and whoever passes the test then take, takes part in a, a, in a draw of some sort. I'll tell you a funny story about such a test. We had, um, I give a course and in order to get um, CME, it's called continuing medical education. I'm sure you know what that is, yeah. credit. The surgeons who took the course needed to get a 70% on the test that I designed. Hmm. Otherwise they wouldn't get the credit for their continuing medical education. Well, just to show you how passionate our team is about helping these kids, our OR scheduler, Okay, asked to take the test, the surgeon's test, and she got an 88. Wow, awesome. <laughs> so the fact that she knew such incredible detail from scheduling patients for their surgery, it really mm. blew my mind that she was so passionate about knowing how to help the children, even though she wasn't one of the doctors. So um, I that's would, uh, very, very interesting. And of course, as you said, passion. And what we are going to do is, I believe we are going to apply for the CMEs on these as well and see if we can put CMEs with them. Yeah, that would be great. All right, so here's another very important diagnostic test. This is called an, uh, the assessment of the sphincters. AMAN stands for anorectal manometry. Anorectal manometry. And what we do, is and this is in conjunction with our gastroenterologists who are one of the four uh, pillars of our team they put this probe in the anus and there's a balloon at the end of the probe and they can detect the pressure in the anus the balloon when it's inflated is supposed to induce a relaxation of the internal sphincter the smooth muscle that's supposed to happen. Well, that makes perfect sense. If you have a stool in your rectum and your stool distends the rectum, the internal sphincter that has been keeping the anus closed all day long, so you didn't have to think about it, now relaxes upon stimulation of the distended rectum. 
However, you don't pass stool. Why? Because there is an external sphincter that you have control over, which now goes to work for the first time that day and squeezes the anus closed, waiting until you can arrive in the right location, get in the correct position, and then relax the sphincters and pass stool. So it's an incredibly complicated system and we can test whether that system is working. So we can test, first of all, whether the internal sphincter relaxes upon distension of the rectum by blowing up the balloon. We can also test whether the external sphincters are the right tone. So there are patients with both areas of problems. There are patients whose internal sphincter fails to relax and there are patients with external sphincters that are too tight. And the treatment of both of these situations is Botox. We inject Botox, botulinum toxin, into the muscle. And if anyone's particularly interested, if there are medical students out there, go look up the mechanism of how Botox affects muscle. Fascinating. Um, we won't get into that today. Um, that makes the sphincters more relaxed and the child, this happens in adults too, by the way, but the child in my circumstances learns how to better coordinate their sphincters. And I think this is an essential test because there are patients out there with constipation that if only their sphincters were better behaved, they would not have constipation at all. So as a surgeon, I know that I should not do anything to a patient surgically, unless I have confirmed that their sphincters are not the problem. And a simple thing like giving Botox might not just solve it. That's very interesting. So number one, this is such a clever test that inflating the balloon is kind of mimicking the presence of stools. And then you can see how the sphincters are doing. And then the management through Botox. Uh, my question to you, does Botox's effect over time reduce and need to be redone or once is enough? Yes, well, B Botox lasts about three or four months. So if the child has not learned the skill of how to relax their sphincters, they may need a second dose. But most patients do well with ap just after their first dose. They relax the sphincters and then they learn how to get them to do what they're supposed to do. Got I, will it. Tell Thank you, you. I will tell you also, back to our Hirschsprung's discussion, it's a very good test for Hirschsprung's disease too, because Hirschsprung's patients have a failure to relax the internal sphincter, but so do other patients with constipation. So if you find a non-relaxing internal sphincter, which is the absence of a rare recto-anal inhibitory reflex, R-A-I-R, the absence of a rare, the failure of the internal sphincter to relax upon distension of the rectum obligates you to check for Hirschsprung's disease with a rectal biopsy. Vast majority of those patients don't have Hirschsprung's disease. They have a sphincter problem that is treatable with Botox. Got it. All right, and here are some, um, some of the images that we see where the balloon inflates and the sphincter fails to relax. You can see where I've labeled anal sphincter, it has a high tone, that green, green zone. There's no dip. There's no blue is relaxed. There's no blue section. After each balloon inflation, the anal sphincter remains unrelaxed. So after each of those yellow lines, there should be blue between the zones of green. And you don't see any. It remains green the entire time. No relaxation of the sphincter. That is an absent rare and is consistent with Hirschsprung's disease, as I said, but it's also consistent with what's called internal sphincter achalasia, which is a failure of the smooth muscle to relax, which responds to Botox. 
Very interesting. Of course, so here Hirschfeld, you are. Of course, sorry. Hirschfeld's disease has needs surgery, which we already talked about. These can be cured Correct. with uh, Botox. I see. So here you are. I'm just repeating for myself. So here you are inflating the balloon to mimic stools in the colon or rectum. Yeah. Sorry. And then ideally, internal sphincter should relax as a result of that to say, all right, time to poop. And then here you're not seeing the relaxation. That's right. It stays it stays high tone the whole time. Got it. So as you can imagine, you have a child who has poop and their sphincters don't relax. They just get more constipated. Mm. So if it's not the sphincters, if the sphincters have been evaluated and they are not the cause of the constipation, then you need to focus on the colon. By the way, let me just mention one more thing related to the sphincters. The pelvic floor has to also relax at the appropriate time. So some training sometimes is involved in teaching a patient how to relax their pelvic floor. It's very similar to Kegel maneuvers that you might teach a pregnant woman so she can relax her pelvic floor at the appropriate time and let the baby come out. Very similar. So you need a cooperative patient, you know, and the patients of certain age might not cooperate yet, but pelvic floor physical therapy is a very important part of the care that these patients need. Got it. So if it's not the sphincters, then this picture shows an assessment of the colon, um, an assessment particularly of the colonic motility. Does the colon move through in a reliable manner? And very similar to those probes that you saw on the anal rectal manometry device, here now you have probes placed throughout the colon that record the activity of the colon, essentially the mm -hmm. EKG of the colon. What is the electrical activity of the colon? And each of those probes measures the activity at that location. So you'll see very interesting. See this is fascinating. Slide, on the next slide, I think it's the next slide. Yes. Look, it looks like an EKG, does it not? It does. Yeah. Well, this is a this is an EKG of the colon. And you can see these nice little waves. Imagine you're at the ocean, you see these waves coming in one at a time, and they are propagating. These are called high amplitude propagating contractions, HAPCs, and the waves are floating through the colon, but you'll notice that on the bottom, uh, let's say three, line, three lines and two lines from the bottom, those two, nothing, flat line. You see the flat line, there's two lines, nothing. So these propagating waves come and boom, nothing, no action. That, in this particular mm. patient, is the sigmoid colon, which has no mm. peristalsis. There's no mo motion in the sigmoid colon. So imagine the patient is ready to poop. The poop is moving through the colon very nicely, very reliably, and hits a, a, a breaker. You know, like in the ocean, they put a, a wall up so that it breaks the waves. So the sigmoid is breaking the waves. And the sigmoid then stops the flow, and they get constipation on those grounds. Very interesting. So the, the movement occurs all throughout these segments and then gets stopped here. And yes. the, the reason could be nerve issues or all those issues that you've discussed in that's, previous... That's correct. The sigmoid, the very typical situation is, well, first of all, the most common situation in colonic motility assessment is that everything moves through, but moves through relatively slowly. That's a, that's a scenario that should respond to medication because you, if you provoke the peristaltic waves to move a little bit faster, you now get a car that used to go 50 miles an hour to going 70 miles an hour and everyone's happy and the constipation is improved. However, there are patients that flow does not go consistently through and it stops uh, in the sigmoid and there on those grounds you can get constipated 
Got it. All right, so let's move into, now that we've given a bit of a background of the evaluation, let's go into some of the treatments based on that. So if you have severe constipation and the sphincters are not doing what they're supposed to do, as I described, the treatment is Botox and biofeedback, pelvic floor physical therapy. And this is one of my favorite slides of the Sharpe dog before and after Botox. Just this is actually the same dog? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> this, is, this is my attempt at making a joke. <laughs> All right, you got me there, though. I said, no, really, this is actually the same dog. Wow, good job, Botox. <laughs> it's two different, two different dogs. Um, but anyway, the concept is that we relax the sphincters and then the patient learns how to keep them relaxed. Um, and this works for constipation in whom, in a patient who, in whom the sphincters are just too tight. They're not relaxing properly. Got it. A quick question for you. Kelly says, how are peristalsis wave, waves provoked? Or well, those, the peristaltic waves are dependent on the nerves in the colon. So the nerves send a signal and move the colon through. So for example, in Hirschsprung's disease, those nerves, remember, those ganglion cells are missing. So there's no impetus for a peristaltic wave. And based on that, the patient is obstructed. In these patients, the nerve signal is weak and therefore it has a reduced wave or no wave at all. So in answer to your question, it's based on the nerves effect. The, the colon itself has nerves. Those, How well do those nerves work at in, in provoking a peristaltic wave? Got it. Thank you. One more question. It seems like a personal advice, which we don't do on this channel. Uh, here is a question. I'm going to put that in front of us anyways. R&B says, I'm 32 and started having constipation issues. Any tips? Not trolling. I want to poop. Yes. Well, we're talking about patients just like this. And basically what I've described here is the evaluation and the treatment of a patient exactly with those concerns. So, Got it. So, my, so these my, discussions that we did, this is the way to first evaluate to see what is wrong. And then based right. on that, then there are management. That's procedures. right. So we went through the evaluation and now we're going through each of the different scenarios and what would be the treatment. So let's do another scenario. All right. The constipation is very severe. The sphincters are fine, but the colon is moving slowly. Treatment. And this is a surgical treatment. You know, I wouldn't really consider Botox a surgical treatment, but I guess it's an intervention. It's a procedure. This is surgery where we take advantage of the fact that the appendix is the beginning of the colon. Um, I think I mentioned some of this in a previous yes. talk, but the appendix yes. is the beginning of the colon. And through the appendix, we can actually insert a tube and push the stool through mechanically, either through what's called a Malone appendicostomy or directly into the cecum, which is the beginning of the colon, skipping the appendix, a cecostomy. My personal preference is a Malone because it can be hidden inside the fold of the belly button. Um, for cosmetic reasons, it's a really nice option. And now what we do is we basically ignore the fact that the patient's nerves are not giving adequate waves of peristalsis, we're pushing the colon to empty by flushing it with a solution, usually saline with something that pushes it along, like something like glycerin. We add that too. And this is a top-down flush for the patient who, whose colon is slow, but whose sphincters are normal. Got it. Got it. That's a very interesting procedure. And a couple of questions here as well. One question is, I think, for the previous slide. Maro says, 
Dr. Levitt, how is biofeedback performed? And yeah, there is so, another question, maybe related. Will a da damaged vagus nerve cause constipation? Is it treatable? So two very good questions. Um, uh, one, biofeedback is basically uh, done by connecting probes to the muscles of the pelvis and displaying the activity of those muscles on a computer screen so that the patient learns that if they squeeze or relax in a certain way, they're affecting those specific muscles. And it's a training exercise. And for kids, it's actually fun. We have like the moving a car across the screen based on certain muscles. They play a game with it and they learn how to control those muscles, particularly relaxing. It's very similar to Kegel maneuvers that pregnant women learn. Um, the second question is relates to the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve doesn't really affect the colon very much. The vagus nerve is more upper, sort of uh, uh, upper intestinal stomach, duodenum, et cetera. Um, vagus nerve has lots of jobs, but doesn't really, um, in, isn't really involved with the lower part, which is the colon. Got it, thank you. Okay, so let's do another, oh, let's, oh here's, we have some nice pictures for you. This is the flush. So a enema bag is hanging there, enters the colon and flushes the colon through as I described. And how do you get access to the colon? Well, there are a couple choices. You can connect to a little tube in the appendix or in the cecum, that little button looking tube, which has a balloon on the other side or you can just connect the appendix to the belly button directly with no tube and the patient comes and passes a tube through the hidden hole in the belly button once a day and administers the flush and then takes out the tube and no one knows that there is a hole in their belly button. Very interesting. What is usually majority of the people what is their preference, the belly button or this, this side? It's, I would say it's pretty split. I think those that are interested in the cosmetic advantage of the uh, Malone uh, and are perfectly happy passing a catheter once a day, choose the option on the right. The patients that aren't so worried about the cosmesis of having a tube visible, but they choose not to pass a catheter because that they, they are uncomfortable with that or they're worried it might hurt, which by the way, it doesn't. Younger kids usually are scared of that. Well, for them, a tube is a better choice because then the caregiver just connects to the little button device and no passage needs to happen. When the child's get a little older, we take out that button device and now they can catheterize. Um, so it very much depends on the patient we discuss both options with them, both are available with at, after the same procedure. In fact, we tell them about it. We put a tube for the surgery that sits there for one month. And at one month, then they decide, do they want a permanent tube or do they want to be passing a tube once a day? Got it. Thank you very much. All right, here's some surgical pictures of what this looks like. So there's the appendix which I'm grasping. And I take the cecum, you can see it on the left, the little buds of the cecum, and wrap it around the appendix to make a valve. So the cecum now is around the appendix, so that if the cecum fills with fluid or stool, it can't go up the chimney because it's compressing the appendix. So it is a valve mechanism that's vitally important to avoid any leakage out of the Malone hole. Got it. So is it so here is the appendix that you have pulled up. Is this the cecum that you kind yes. of pulled yes. here and kind of wrapped it around this area? Precisely. Very interesting. Now here are some pictures of a pa for a patient who has no appendix. As I suspect one of the audience is going to say, well, what if I don't have an appendix? We can make an appendix if one is missing because the patient, let's say, 
had a previous appendicitis, we cut a little rectangle with the blood vessel in the middle of it. We roll the rectangle out and then we tubularize the, recta, the, the rectangle over a tube to recreate essentially what looks like an appendix. Wow, beautiful. So you took this flap with its own blood supply and then yeah. converted that into a tube. And now that tube can be used for the flush. Exactly. So it makes you want to go back and become a surgeon, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this is a picture of what's called a cecostomy. This is another access to the colon, another surgical procedure. Again, not my preference because I like the cosmetic aspect of the using the appendix, but some surgeons connect the cecum, which is the beginning of the colon, to the abdominal wall, very similar to a gastrostomy tube, like you would connect the stomach. Here, the cecum is tacked to the abdominal wall. Actually, there's the appendix. They chose not to use the appendix. The thing that's stuck up to the ceiling there, all the way at the top, is a segment of the cecum. And through that, you must have a tube, because if you go tubeless, it will certainly leak. Because the only way you can mm. avoid it from leaking is to do that plication, that valve mechanism I spoke about, which is why I like to use them alone. But just for completion's sake, this is an image of a cecostomy. Got it. So here the cecum is connected to the wall. And as you said, if there is no valve here, then it is going to leak. So you must have an indwelling tube at all times. Otherwise, it would, the otherwise it would leak. Mm. And so does it leak in the tube as well? So tube acts as a catch or it acts as a block? Well, the tube sits in there. There's a balloon on the inside and there's a va there's a the tube is on the outside. Same tube I showed in the other picture. So there's nowhere there's Got no it. way to leak. You open up the little connector and you pass here. There it is. So that could there it is. See costume. There's that middle picture is exactly what that would look like. Got it. Understood. Thank you. All right, now we're even getting cooler. So there are patients who need them alone, but also have a problem with their bladder. And they need mm. access to their bladder because their bladder does not empty successfully through the normal route. Sometimes mm. if we collaborate, and as, I met, as you mentioned in my introduction, there are four parts of our team, colorectal, urology, gynecology, and GI, Sometimes we collaborate with our urology team and we take this beautiful appendix and we share it. And part of it becomes the Malone and part of it comes becomes access to the bladder, which is called the Mitrofenoff. So the Very interesting. So you actually route the bladder content in the uh, appendix, a part yes. of the appendix. We put that, the distal appendix, the one on the right of the picture, we implant that into the bladder or our urologists do and then that goes to the abdominal wall very similar to what i described for the malone but in this case a catheter goes in and takes out the urine and in the malone case a mm -hmm. catheter goes in and flushes the colon but we can do this operation so we can do this operation at the same time there are two two openings on the abdominal wall we can do this operation at the same time and in the same operation render the patient clean for stool and dry for urine beautiful thank you very much for this there's a question um by bear bait he's saying thank you where can patient be directed well if a patient so guess... is, is a child um i would uh you know Obviously, we're happy to help help you, um, but you can go online and see if there's a colo pediatric colorectal center near you. Uh, for adults with problems, I would probably start with a gastroenterologist and or a colorectal surgeon. Got it. And Texas Max says, I wonder what GI doctors, surgeons, and teams are well educated like this across the country, U.S. and the world. That's a good question. I wonder what you either. Well, my mission is to get them all up, up to speed and all educated. I've been very passionate about trying to develop other colorectal centers 
throughout the world and throughout the United States. And there is every opportunity to get educated. There is a lot, liter lot of literature written about it. Um, there are some, there's a, some very devoted centers. We have a very nice consortium in pediatric colorectal called the PCPLC, Pediatric um, um, Colorectal and Pelvic Learning Consortium. There's a website, PCPLC, that you could check out. Um, just, just type Pediatric. in. Pediatric Colorectal and Pelvic Learning Consortium. There it is. Google has offered it up to you. Um, and this is the the groups of uh, the teams that um, around the country um, that have devoted have a devoted team for colorectal uh, care. So this will give you a nice list. Got it. And I I just uh, for the viewers I just put the link in the in the chat. Superb. So that's the answer. Uh, to your question. There's a lot that can be learned and done um, or gravitate towards those centers that have already been working in these in these fields. What do, we have, what do we have as our next slide to talk through? Okay. And Wild Horses says, any centers in California? Yes, absolutely. Are we talking pediatric or adult in California? In, uh, because and do are, we have for both? Well, every... Every major medical center has adult colorectal surgery. Um, you may start, you might start there. Pediatric colorectal needs a devoted center, and that list of in the consortium is probably the best place to start. But yes, there are um, there are some states still without a center, without a devoted colorectal center. But California um, is uh, certainly not one of them. It's a wonderful place to get care. Got it. All right, so this is a, a cute picture of how we um, make it a little bit less scary for the patient, for the child, because here they have a special doll that our child life specialists have created where you can actually have the child pass the catheter into the belly button of the doll, and they can uh, realize that it's not so big a deal, and maybe they could do that on themselves. Got it. All right, another scenario. The flushes that you've done with your Malone almost always work. They almost always work, greater than 90% of the time. And by the way, those flushes are great for patients, as I said, who have severe constipation, who can't respond to medical management. But there are other patients that for behavioral reasons, severe autism is a really good example, they won't take their medicine or behaviorally they cannot potty train successfully we've used malones in those patients because they got a mechanical way of emptying their colon now on rare occasion the colon does not empty despite the flush and in those cases we sometimes also need a surgeon to remove part of the colon and this is based on our assessment of the colonic manometry. And here you see an example of where the sigmoid colon, the big monstrosity there, has been removed. And the better part, the narrower part, has, left, was, has been brought down and connected to the rectum, the rectum there at the very bottom. So the healthy part, and then that, this patient will now empty better now that the large part of the colon, the problematic part has been removed. But as I said, this is very, very rare. Almost every patient responds to the Malone by itself. Got it. All right, and then one final thing to mention, which I have very little experience of, A, very little experience with. There are others that have more, and this is much more common in adults. But occasionally you have a patient with urologic issues and constipation, the flushes are not working. And you may want to consider this. This is sacral nerve stimulation. It's like a pacemaker. But instead of pacing the heart, it paces the colon and the bladder. These, the probes are placed into the sacrum where the, where the nerves emanate from the spine. So there's the pacemaker. You can see the sacrum, the tailbone is where the little probes are placed through the foramina, the holes of the sacrum. 
you just trace that down, you'll see that the wires go into the little hole. There you go. And they enhance the nerve mo movement, the nerve activity. They soup it up. Um, and this can improve the function of the colon and the function of the bladder. It's particularly used in patients with bladder symptomatology, but it also can help constipation. Very interesting. And that brings us to our conclusion. And this is yet another one of my funny slides of a question mark made from a colon. And I particularly like this cartoon of the representation of the GI tract. It's a very cute little acid gets poured it. into the stomach and then, then the bile gets added and, and then it moves through and there's the colon producing the final product, which is what we've been talking about. Thank you so much for this. Th this is actually a very cute diagram. <laughs> well, listen, it's all for and, you. Uh, and it's all for you and for all of your um, all of your participants to enjoy these these pictures. And um, I can tell you, for, as one observer, we're very very appreciative of you providing this wonderful educational format. And um, I'm happy to contribute to the content. Thank you so much. Actually, this has been so valuable. Um, number one, even I did not know this deep level of uh, issues and then surgical corrections and the whole speciality there. So thank you very much for bringing it to light. I can actually see in the comments how many folks right now who are watching are appreciative and they're curious for how do we go find a center? How do we get help? So this is clearly a lot of uh, important contribution from you. So thank you for doing that. Um, can I ask you a few questions that folks are asking? Sure, of course. So um, the follow-up was from Wild Horse was adults. So I think you discussed that there are all centers have? Yes, yeah, so any, any major medical center should have a adult colorectal department. And that's where I would start. Got it. Here it says, what volume of flush is safe? Are there risks with flushing? Well, we um, need to judge each patient as an individual. And we look at the contrast study. So we see how big is the colon. And based on that, we determine the, the volume of the flush. That, would be, that question would be like, how much water do you need to fill the swimming pool? Well, my first question would be, what size swimming pool? Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the flush is, can, usually contains either water or salt water, saline. And then we add something to that to make it a little stronger. And we base the volume and the content on the size of the colon. In that contrast study I showed you, we need that information. And then we take a guess, an educated guess, as to what the flush would be required. Now, I will tell you, spoiler alert, there will be another session on this very forum talking about bowel management, where my colleagues who are true experts in this uh, are nurses, nurse practitioners, and PAs that work on our team are going to present the, a little more detail about bowel management. So tune in for that one, and I think you'll get your answer. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question from here is, would, would nerve stimulation work for MS patients? Yes, I don't, I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, MS, I'm certain, I'm sus suspect you're talking about mul multiple sclerosis. Um, yeah. My only connection to that disease, I will tell you, is that my father, who I hope is also proud of me, um, as we talked about at the beginning, is a retired neurologist. So he knows all about that. Um, so if he's listening, he might be able to answer. Um, but that's a, that's a question I really just do not know the answer to. I'm so sorry. Got it. This is a question from Wild Horses. Constipation and related problems worsened after having CVID. Any thoughts on that inflammation? 
I'm sorry. What what is meant by COVID? COVID, maybe. Oh, COVID. Okay. Um, if that's in fact what they what they mean, um, I actually have not heard a lot about the GI impact of COVID, and that may just me showing my ignorance on this particular topic. It has not really affected our colorectal patients in children at all. And we've had lots of kids who have had uh, cases of COVID and have had questions about their constipation management, et cetera. I really have not seen any effect. That may be different in adults, if you're asking about it in an adult, and I wouldn't be the right person to um, uh, answer that question. Yeah, so just a quick note from me. There are 4% of the patients, adult patients, who end up getting gastroenteritis with the coronavirus, especially SARS-CoV-2, and they can develop severe um, inflammation in their gut and gastroenteritis-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and then constipations as well. And we are also seeing in the long COVID that even after the um, COVID symptoms are over, patient may actually develop uh, inflammation of the GIT and they would either develop um, a lot of gas and explosive diarrhea or sometimes then they have alternative spells of uh, constipation as well. And many doctors are now um, diagnosing them as IBS. So it is, I think it would be interesting while horses to contact a gastroenterologist to get that workup done to see what is going on in the in the GIT. Um, there is a <laughs> Bron W says, "I wish you were here in Australia." So, are you making a center there as well? Well, there's a fantastic center in Australia, in Melbourne. Um, um, my good friends are there. I have visited a few times, and actually, will be visiting again in 2023. Um, but yes, uh, if we're talking about a child, um, you have, and you have also really good care in Sydney um, for children with colorectal problems. I have a number of colleagues there. Uh, feel free, if you'd like, to email me directly, um, and I'm happy to try to help you and try to make a connection for you. Um, and uh, you can, you're welcome to put my email in the chat, but if you go to our website, um, it says email Dr. Levitt right under my name, right under my uh, picture, and feel free to do that. I'm happy to help you in any way that I can. Yeah, let, let me quickly um, present your site. So here is the, and this this video's description has these links. So here is the link to Children's National Hospital and meet Dr. Mark Levitt. Yeah. And if you see, I believe here somewhere should be the email address. Yes, if you just look up, yes, if you just click on me and it describes me, um, it right under my picture it will say email Dr. Levitt. So this is Got a little and I think it's here just, as well. go in, just go into our uh, our main patients, uh, our main uh, website for the col just put in colorectal a center, Children's National Hospital. Oh, that this probably is it. And um, if you go down, it probably says. Hey, if you click on, if you click on me, click on my name there. Right there, it should click. There you go. And then I suspect it's going to say email, email Dr. Levitt. Hopefully, hopefully so. it. down there. No. Uh, there it is, email, yeah. right there. Got it, excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, Braun, I hope that that answers that question. By the way, I, Braun, Braun I, I, was, I love my time in Australia. When I was in medical school, I did a full month in Sydney, and it was a great, great time. I, I love that country, and I just wish it wasn't so far away. So one more question from Bear Bait. How long does it take to flush? Yeah, that's a very good question because obviously you're imposing a, um, a treatment on a patient that they have to do every day. Most patients can complete their flush between 30 and 45 minutes. So 
um, it's time to sit on the toilet uh, to watch a movie, uh, uh, read a book, play with a certain toy. Um, but if they do that every day, then they don't really worry about poop for the next 24 hours. Got it. So I was just scanning the chat. It seems like we are good. So Dr. Levitt, thank you very much for this chat. I think these are one of the most important and interesting talks in Dr. Bean's portfolio and on YouTube on our channel. Super. Very valuable and very, very uh, important, not only for non-medicals, but for medical professionals and students as well. So thank you for doing this. Sure, my pleasure. And uh, have, a, uh, have a wonderful session the next time with our wonderful nurses, NPs, and PAs who will help elucidate the uh, bowel management um, idea, which I think will be also very valuable. Awesome. So thank you very much. And Cool Beans and audience, thank you very much for listening in as well. I would see you this evening with the next lecture. Bye-bye for now. Take care.